Good. Um, what I want to present today in this talk is actually some reporting on research analysis we have been doing on domain names that have been registered on the .eu TLD. So we have actually been analyzing all the registrations in .eu, and we're actually trying to uh, understand how large bunches of malicious domain names are all being registered by malicious actors. And the work I present today here is joint work between our research lab at KU Leuven and also ERIT, which is the registry for .eu. So together, actually, we did this analysis, and we went to the insights that we can present today. How will the talk look like? I will first start with a little bit of research context. What do we exactly mean with malicious domain names? How do actors actually work? What is the main idea? What do we actually want to research in this analysis? Then we go a little bit deeper into the data set that we have been using in doing the analysis, the malicious domain names that we actually found in the .au TLD. And then I will show you some of the insights we found in our total analysis. We studied the domain names for 14 months long. Those insights are actually trying to understand how do malicious actors work, and more important, if you understand how they work, can we actually make it life harder for them? Can we actually make it much harder for them to register domain names? And the last two parts in the, the presentation will be rather short. They were actually looking forward. If we now did all that work of doing the manual analysis, how can we automate this to do this on a more regular time frame, but also on more TLDs? And secondly, if we have all the information available of how attackers actually work, maybe it's time to take the next step. How can we actually prevent or detect this as close as possible to the registration time? But first, a little bit of context. So what are those malicious domain names? Well, most of you here are already very familiar with the fact that domain names are a key factor in internet and also for attackers. They're actually using this as kind of an enabler to launch their attacks. For spam, they need domains to send domains for, uh, their mails from. To communicate with the uh, command and control in botnets, they need domain names because they are actually much easier to replace or to update than fixed IP addresses. Same for phishing and for malware. And the trend that we see recently within the, the malicious uh, community is that they're actually trying to avoid blacklisting. They're trying to be much more in hit-and-run strategy. So they're actually using a domain name, and then they disperse it. They go to the next domain name. Because once it's blacklist, you can't do anything with the domain name. Most of the mail servers will block you and so on. So you see that there's actually a very fast flux in the use of domain names for one particular attack. And it's a single shot. After a uh, study in 2013 already shows, 60% of the malicious domain names after one day is not used anymore. So you just use it for less than one day, you throw it away, and you go to the next domain name. So that's the idea. But if that is the, the context we're working in, one of the research hypotheses we had is if malicious actors need so many domain names, well, they actually need to register the domain names in bulk because they need for a longer period of time a continuous stream of new fresh domain names that they can use for abusive uh, measures. And if that is the hypothesis, we can actually validate that, but also we can actually search one step further. Are we able to identify such bulk behavior and registrations based on certain commonalities, common patterns that we see between those malicious registrations? Uh, as I already said, the long-term goal, if we have such patterns, if you understand how that registration process is working, then maybe we can go one step further and detect and prevent them before they do any malicious harm or any harm at our systems. That's the main idea of this presentation. Of course, in order to do such an analysis, we need data. We need to actually see the registration data. We need to actually be searching for patterns in that data set. So this collaboration between Dishnet and uh, Urit .eu is actually run by Eurit Registry. It's the seventh largest country code TLD that we have. They have about, I would say, four million domain names now in their data set. And the data set that we have been using in our uh, analysis is only domain names that were for the first time registered. So if a domain name is transferred or re-registered, we did not take that into account in our analysis. But in our analysis, during 14 months, we had 824,000 registrations. About 2.5% of them were flagged as malicious by external parties. So this is the data set we are working on. All the graphs and so all the figures you will see today are based on this data set. What information did we have available? Of course, the basic information about the domain name, also which register has been used when it was registered. Very normal, of course. We also have, as part of our process, information about the registrant, who is actually registering this domain name. We have a company name, name, the language being used, the email address, phone, even a postal address. The main idea of doing registrations in the .eu TLD is you need to provide correct 
contact information in order to register a domain name. Of course, you also need some technical details to actually operate with your domain name. So also name server information is available. And if you are using name servers within your own domain, you also need glue records, IP addresses, that actually bootstrap the whole way of actually looking up your name server. So this is the information that we got available by actually collaborating together with ERID, uh, the .eu registry. We did enrich that data set with two parts. First, we went to want to know which of those domain names are actually malicious. Because we can see 800,000 domain names, we need to know which are the ones that we are interested in our analysis. And for that, we actually queried three sources of malicious behavior, the blacklists. We used Spamhouse, we also uh, queried Sure, and we also used the Google Safe Browsing List. And we did this typically on a daily basis for 13 days, and then every week we repeated until six months after registration. This is one part. Now we know which domain names in our data set are malicious. The second thing is, we also wanted to see where the name servers are located. So we wanted to have actually the geolocation information of the name servers, and therefore we use the MaxMind free database to look up the name servers at the time of registration. Okay, now we have all the components. We know which data set we're using, all the instruments that we have been made in. We know what we actually want to search for. Now it's time to actually go and look in that longitudinal analysis. But first, let me introduce you the concept of a, uh, of a campaign. So a campaign is a set of registrations that are registered with malicious intent. They are most probably from the same actor, so the same organization, the same team, the same person, and they are typically registered over a longer period of time. So this correlates with the hypothesis that we had, they are being registered in bulk over a longer period of time. Of course, within our data set, we actually have to query data. So for us, our approximation is something that we can manually select based on a common pattern in our data set, and it runs for a longer period of time. And the common pattern is linkable to it's the same actor or the same team doing it, because they're using the same contact information, they have the same pattern, they're using the same tools to actually create registrant information. Of course, this is all vague. Maybe let's look a little bit deeper in one particular uh, example of a campaign. This is campaign C11, and you will see numbers later on on campaigns. But this campaign was running for about eight months, from June to February, and consists of about 1,200 domain names that were actually flagged by external parties. So we did not say that they were malicious, external parties were saying that those were malicious. How did it look? Well, mainly look to the registration information that was used, the contact information of the registrant. They were all using the same fixed email provider, namely a private domain name used for email communication. They had, uh, in that domain name, two email accounts, three phone numbers, and two streets. And they were using not them separate registrants, but they're actually recombining the same emails, phone numbers, and streets over and over to create new registrant information. They also used four registers back to back. So actually sequentially, over those eight months time, they used four different registers to actually provide them the services to register domain names in the registry. So you see already quite a lot of registrations for one particular campaign. So we actually assume that this is all from one actor. If you're looking a little bit more to the different campaigns, this is the overview that actually sketches a highlight on what did we investigate. So we have the full period of 14 months here. We have 20 different campaigns. So these are 20 different selection criteria that we used to isolate a set of registrations potentially coming from the same actor. We see some of them are actually going up to 2,000 registries. Some of them are only about 100, 120 registrations. And the, the size of the bullets on the line or actually the sizes of how many, how intense was that campaign on a day-by-day -day basis. And you see it goes up to 400 registrations that one day, one campaign can deliver. So some of them are a little bit more on strict days. Some of them have a very strict pattern that they are doing it on a very regular basis over a longer period of time. So this is the base ID, but of course this is just the graph that we say this is the end result. Let's now go and look a little bit deeper in what we actually found as uh, interesting insights in those campaigns. But first, let me recap how we actually did that campaign identification process, because it helps to understand how we came to the concept of campaigns. So in order to actually do that, this is a more iterative process. We typically start from all the malicious domains that we have in our data set. But there, of course, you have like 21,000 domain names. Where do you start looking at to find certain selection criteria that actually can link similar uh, registrations to each other? Well, we have different tactics that we have been using. For instance, you can look to days 
that are very intensive with malicious registrations. You can look to uh, registration details that are reused quite a lot. For instance, one mail provider or one street or one email address is actually being used in a lot of email registrations over time. Then that's a good point. You could also look to registrations that have recognizable patterns. For instance, we found email addresses with very distinct patterns, like this one has a kind of a number and then a certain mail provider. And you also see the frequent combination of two illogical uh, combinations of uh, registrations. For instance, a certain country and a certain mail provider that only appears within the malicious registration data set. And we then apply this on the benign and the malicious data, uh, data parts and try to see which of those criteria do fit well in the malicious set and do not pop up a lot of results in the benign set because that's a kind of good of identifier. It's really a good precise identicator for malicious traffic. We will do that. We will discuss this later. But this is indeed. No, no. Here it is just if it's for like a 50 50 or 60 40, it's already a good indicator. If you see that if you apply it to the malicious, it's only giving a fraction of 2%, but it's actually a 10% fraction in the benign, then it might not be such a good selector. But we will discuss a little bit later on the, the, the way we can actually extend blacklist. But that's a good point. So to give you the example, here we see the graph which actually shows you the relative number of registrations on a daily basis. So you see that this is the malicious number. We have the same graphs for the, the benign numbers. But the malicious number have actually spikes in traffic where they actually have days where a lot of malicious registrations have been registered. And those are good starting points, for instance, for your analysis. Or in those days, there, is, it, is there any bulk behavior there where you see, for instance, 100 or 200 registrations all are using the same domain name or uh, a mail provider or using the same phone number and so on. This is one indicator. Another indicator, for instance, if you say we have all the malicious email providers set up here, we have countries. What are the hotspots of combinations of countries and mail providers? This is the data on the malicious set with the threshold of you need more than 50 registrations per dot. We could do the same with the benign and then see are there any hotspots that are actually present in the malicious set which are not present in the benign set. Might be a good starting point as well. And for instance, we could start already with three points. In our analysis, we actually found out that all the green points belong to campaigns and the red dots do not belong to campaigns. So this is actually a good indicator that those hotspots are a good way to start to identify the campaigns. Of course, it's all kind of a practice. You need to iteratively look into and filter data within the data set. What's more interesting for this audience is actually if you look at the 20 campaigns, what type of criteria did we use in the selection criteria to select this is this particular campaign? So we see that we're using domain name, the registrar, and the name service in some of the registrations. But most of the, the campaigns were actually selected based on data used for the registrant. Which name, which address, which email account, which email provider. And those are the ones that actually have the most impact in selecting the right campaigns out of the, the full data set. Good. Any questions so far before we go into the insights what we found within the campaigns? Um, okay, let me re-answer that question after the first insight because that might actually be a good mapping to, to answer that. Um, what we used here is a full post-factum analysis, so we actually have the data, we waited for a few months and then we started the analysis. Of course, then we're looking when was that domain name being listed on a blacklist and that's actually the that answer there. Any other questions? So the, the, the question was, where did you get the data from? Uh, two sources. The registration data was in the collaboration together with Erit. We actually investigated the data directly, all the contact information and so on. For the maliciousness, we actually queried the three sources. So for Spamhouse and Sure, we sent out a lot of DNS queries to query whether a domain name was in their list of blacklist, uh, blacklist domains. And Google Safe Browsing has an API to query. So that's actually the source. We did not use, for instance, Let's Encrypt or Transparency or other sources to actually enrich it. It could be interesting to see if you enrich that, 
how actually would that change our analysis of could, could we find additional campaigns, but we did not do that. We, we stick to three providers. No, we don't publish them because they're actually containing personal information, personal identifiable information, but that is actually together with Earth, we did actually search queries on that database. Yep, indeed, it's a collaboration. So to, to answer the question, when not actually those domain names being used, uh, I will transfer it a little bit differently. How long did it take before the domain name ended up on a blacklist? And actually we see here that there's a small window of opportunity. Once it's on the blacklist, you actually there's almost no use for malicious intent possible anymore. So it's actually, the moment you're getting in there, it's game over. And we see in a graph that around 75% of the domain names is already flagged by blacklist services after five days. And after 30 days of registration, then 98% of them are already on the blacklist. And later on, we only see 2% being added to that blacklist service. So in that sense, when are they used? Typically in a window between zero and five days, I would say. So it's actually quite short, not necessarily the day itself, but typically in a short frame. So you might imagine that there might even be an uh, underground activity that people are creating domain names and then selling them to malicious actors. That, that's the hypothesis that we have in the way the ecosystem is working. So, yeah, so the delay is because we only see the data after uh, some period of time. Well, we see that even certain of the, the command and control domain names are already in use before the domain name gets registered. So for certain types it is there. The, the fact that we are a little bit later in the game here is because it takes some time before we actually can start querying the database. So we don't do it instantly whenever we get a domain name. It's typically a 6 to 24 hour delay, and that's actually popping up there. Also, yes, it's almost the latest, latest slides, but yes, we have. <laughs> to give you an idea, we are performing, I think, 700,000 DNS queries a day to actually get that malicious activity data. So we're doing quite some, doing it more intense would be not feasible at this moment. Second thing, where do the data come from? So I already mentioned that we have three providers, but what actually is the data that we see for what are the campaigns being used? We see these are the typical abuse types. We see the majority of them are actually being for spam. So it's also uh, quite obvious that for spam, there's much more reporting. The moment you get spam in there, you can report, you can collect, you can see it over different mail servers, domains get blacklist. For command and control, it's much diff more difficult to get the whole hold on how many domain names are being used for command and control. So in that sense, I think the other numbers, there might be muscle, more domain names and a registration data set that are used for malicious activity, but since they are not arriving on blacklist, we don't have them in our malicious data set. Second insight, which of the domain names, uh, which of the providers that we use for blacklisting and which were actually interesting? Well, we see between the spam house and SIR that there's actually a good, um, I would say coverage by pulling them together. We see certain of the campaigns were only detected by one of those, and for others, actually they're actually finding the complement of each other, which means you actually need multiple sources to get a good ground truth. Also interesting fact, if you're looking to the last column, the Google Safe Browsing, less than 2% of the domain names that we actually consider in our malicious data set came from Google Browsing might also be related to the fact that the domain names here are more infrastructural and related to spam, and those are less reported within the browser. Again, it depends on which are the use cases that you're looking for. So in that sense, when I'm talking about malicious campaigns, keep in mind it's mainly what is being used for spam and phishing. Good. I already showed you the graph, and if you look to the graph, you might already see with the 20 campaigns, certain things are popping up. You see some interesting things that are already in there. And the first thing is, there might be actually a large variety in the way campaigns are running. So for instance, here we have a very small campaign. It's, it's only 37 days, but it's quite intensive. It already has about 2,000 registrations in those 37 days. At the same moment, we also see within our data set that there are campaigns running over about 300 days, reusing registrant information, and only having 154 registrations. So it's not that all the actors are actually abusing or uh, registering the same bulk number of domain names with the same tools, with the same intensity. Another interesting insight that we had is, it seemed that the malicious actors are humans as well. In the graphs that we found, here we're plotting the uh, hour of the day, uh, the, the, the moment 
that a registration has been done over day by day basis. And you see the, the greenish blue line is actually the benign registrations and their daily share. And you see they're all more registrations during the week and less in the weekend. But when we're looking to the malicious registration, we see that the spikes are much harder. So you see almost no registrations during the weekend, and most of the malicious registrations are happening during the week. Of course, we can't say that this is purely because the malicious actors are working on business hours. It, <laughs> it could be. We can only make hypotheses about this. Another hypothesis could also be that it's much more interesting for them to mimic the, the office hours because then they actually might go a little bit more under radar. If they would do all the registrations on a continuous basis, they would actually already differentiate versus the benign traffic. But maybe they, did, they, they just overdid it. They're doing too much registration during the week versus the weekend, but we see such a pattern. Okay, we, we can't make a, a conclusive answer why it is, but more interesting if you're looking to the time of the year. So we're doing the same analysis for the full period of time, 14 months. Here is only the malicious traffic. Here again we see that it's like a, a summer break, a Christmas break, and a spring break. I'm not sure whether they're actually taking holiday. I hope they do, because it's from time to time happy to, to make a holiday. But it could also be that it's because they want to be as effective as possible. It could be if they're launching a new spam campaign during the summer break, that they actually have, uh, has less effect than doing the same spam campaign in June or August. So also there, we might see the pattern, but we're not sure if it's actually a fact that they are actually taking a holiday or the fact that they're actually trying to make it as most effective as possible. We saw certain topics, for instance, on May 1st and so on, um, small spikes uh, before and after, but it also you have to take into account there for the one days, there could also be certain effects at resellers or registrars. Because they're using the normal ecosystem to, re to uh, register domain names, it could be a spike on Black Friday, could be because one of the resellers is just giving them very, very cheap domain names. So in that sense, we didn't dive in to much deeper than the week pattern. That week pattern was continued over the whole year. The, the year pattern we can see, if you dive in deeper details, there are so many uh, effects that we have not under control that can influence the data. But, but indeed, there could be effects there as well. But a little bit more about uh, the business hours. We try to actually see at what time of the day did they register. And that's not for all the campaigns, but some campaigns have actually quite distinct patterns. For instance, let's look at C18, this campaign 18. We see that they're typically working in box from 8 to 10 hours. It's not that they're working continuously, they're doing it slow, but all the domain registration are always done in that kind of period of time. Interesting. Again, is it mimicking or is it actually that normal behavior? We can't actually know for sure. Yeah, it's also time zone shifts, that's true. I actually think it's to the west. Because they're lo later in our time zone. And yeah, it could also be that they're just lazy and, and also only get up late in, at the morning and so on. I'm not sure. But again, we only see the data, we don't see the person after the data. It, it would be interesting to see the one behind the data. More interesting on the C11, we see a morning and an afternoon. Do they actually take lunch breaks of about two hours? It is quite long. Again, we don't know for sure. We only see that certain campaigns are actually reflecting certain behavior that we did not expect when we started this analysis. But, but be reassured. We think about automation. Some others do think about automation as well. So here we see a campaign that is doing kind of a not so intensive campaign, only a few registrations per day, but it's always doing it at the same hours. And it's actually doing it from January onwards, two times a day. And if you even mind this European summertime, this is at our site that our system was just changing to, to summertime. But you see, they are actually most of their activity is always on the same time. It's just a cron tap or anything else running on their system. So not all of them are working according to office hours. Not all of them are just human typing in things. I didn't put it in the presentation, but uh, one of the interesting things, we found actually typing mistakes in registered information domain names, and so on. So it might actually be that they have a list of things that they have to pull, and it's easier or cheaper to type it in than automate. So now the question is, who is doing all that stuff? Who is actually registering all those domain names? Or who is facilitating that? So the first thing that we looked at is, who are the registrars actually enabling them? 
And we saw, for instance, register five, we of course obviously anonymized this register. He's actually responsible for 50% of all the malicious domain names in our data set, which is kind of interesting. Is that register of bad intent? Not sure. It could be that he's actually the cheapest one and that the, 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 the malicious actors are just being very cost effective in registering their, their domain names. It could also be because the whole ecosystem of DNS is working with registrars and resellers that a lot of resellers have actually good contacts with this registrar. Or you can pay in Bitcoin. So there can be many different reasons, but we see that this one is popping out. Also, their toxicity actually means that more than one third of the domains that that registrar is registering, you already know for sure it will be malicious. Remember, the average was 2.5. Let's look at the domain names. Well, uh, the, the, the email providers, the domain names of the email providers. So, of course, we see here in the top three, the three public email providers that, that we can use. We see Gmail and AOL, for instance. It's interesting to compare. We see that Gmail has like 20% of the contact information used for malicious domain names has a Gmail address. About 10% has an AOL address. Interesting here. Gmail, if you look into the toxicity, only have 2%. So Gmails are more likely used in benign registration than in malicious registrations. Whereas if you look to AOL, if you do a registration with an AOL address, well, our system will probably already give you a red flag just because of your AOL address. Keep, keep that in mind. We see that m almost half of the registrations done with an AOL address in registrant information is just malicious in our data set. And the third thing that I want to focus on here in the top enablers, so these are fixed email addresses used by uh, attackers. If you just take the top three email addresses used by registrants in the, the registration database, they already account for around 70% of all the malicious registrations that we have in our database. And also interesting here, we see, for instance, the first and the third email address is close to 100% toxicity. Actually means that whatever they register, be damn sure, it's actually a bit malicious intent. Well, those are the things that are not flagged by external services. But we can actually assume that there's either our tests before they're starting to run, or certain domains are not used or not seen by the blacklist services or reported. So coming back on the, the, the idea of we have campaigns here, we have blacklists, they do not exactly match one-on-one. -on -one. Um, here we actually try to, to see, if you say we have about 20,000 uh, domain names that are in the set of blacklisted data, we also have about 20, 21% of domain names that are campaigns. We see 16,000 of them are shared, so that means that if you say it's a part of a campaign, it's also being flagged externally. We were interesting to see what, what is actually happening in those campaigns. They are using the same campaign criteria as the ones that are being flagged, but they are not flagged. So we did actually do a manual analysis of those about 4,000 domains to see whether those domain names were actually malicious intent or mistakes on our side were false positives. And our conclusion is there that less than 1% of them are false positives. So in that whole set, about 200 of the domain names are actually potentially benign, we don't know for sure, but all the rest we actually could validate that they were used for malicious intent. That actually means if you are using this kind of analysis techniques, there is actually the potential to extend the existing blacklist services with an additional about 20% of extra information, which might be nice just because of looking to the registrant information on the domain name. And the last insight I would like to discuss today is the fact that attackers, they are clever as well. They adapt over time. So I already mentioned in the beginning that they have adaptive strategies. For instance, this campaign, C11, has four different registrars and is actually jumping from register to registrar. We see certain small pikes on the first one. It might be that the reseller is from time to time also, for instance, taking the cheapest route for a registration. But the registrars is something, obviously, that we can see in the graph. But we saw much more variation within the adaptation done by the malicious actors. So for instance, if you're looking to the registrars, we see some of them are using three, two, four, three registrars in line with the graph we saw before. But they're actually creating fake identities over and over. So in order to actually register the domain name, a malicious actor needs registered information. They need an email address, a phone number, an address. And they're actually using tools, or they're doing it manually, to create new fake addresses, new fake numbers, new email addresses. And you see certain of them are actually just sticking to one phone number or one email address. But some of them are actually using 20, 50, 70 of those identities. And what we saw in our data set is that they're often having actually a kind of a pool 
of street names, a pool of names, a pool of phone numbers, and they are at random combining them to new registered information, which a little bit helped us in actually compiling this kind of analysis. Then the question is, of course, now we have done a whole manual analysis. It's a one-time thing that we did. There are two options. Either we can try to automate this analysis and even improve with automatic tools the things that we now found manually. This is road number one. We can actually also try to go to the fact that we say, now we can actually use that information to protect the TLD, to protect the end users. So let me first look into how can we automate the campaign identification, and then look into how can we actually improve the quality of domain names in the TLD. So the first one, what we try to do is actually, now we actually grouped based on similarities and, and patterns, different registrations together. We can also use machine learning techniques. And one of the techniques that we used in our study was agglomerative clustering, where actually we actually grouping uh, registrations together based on similarities between the, the registrations until we actually find a, a certain optimum. We did that and we found that we, when we have 432 clusters, which actually 30, 40, 432 groups of domain names, the 30 largest clusters already represent 92% of our data set, which was for us a good cutoff to say, let's look in the 30 largest clusters within that machine learning set. And here we map it on the x-axis, we see the clusters that are automatically compiled by the computer, by the agglomerative clustering. On the y-axis, we see the 20 campaigns that we have. And we're trying to validate how well did we do, where can we improve, where do we better than automate it. And so these are the three insights that we have on this part. So what are the findings here? Well, good news, the green ones here, for about uh, 26 of those clusters, we can find exactly one campaign that matches that cluster. A campaign can exist out of multiple of those clusters, which actually means that there are multiple similar registrations all linked to the same campaign, but we see there's a one-on-one -on -one mapping. Unfortunately, it's not the case for all of those. We see, for instance, that for three of them, we see one cluster, which actually means very similar registrations, and they end up in our analysis in two different campaigns. And we see it for three, uh, for three periods. That actually makes uh, an assumption that it's not 20 actors, but about 17 actors that are being active within the .eu TLD. And indeed, for some of them, you can actually visually already see that there's some correlation. For instance, the first C1 and C2 also in time correlate quite nice. And also, if we inspect it manually, what are the relationships between the two campaigns? We see that we're reusing certain of the registration data in between that we're using, for instance, the same phone number and so on. So if we would have been doing our manual criteria analysis even a little bit better, probably we would have ended up with C2 and C3 being one campaign. And the same for the other two. So this is something the automatic tool can help to improve the identification process. The second thing, we see clusters that are not mapped to any of the campaigns. Interesting. That means that we missed something. And indeed, with this cluster 16, we did some manual validation, and it ended up that we were too restrictive in specifying campaign C20. So on the same days, with the same patterns, but with a different email provider, cluster 16 was active. So if we would actually combine the manual and automate it, we for sure we would say C16 here is belonging to campaign 20. So the automatic tools can improve. So it's all bad that we so, do so badly in doing the manual analysis. Luckily, we found also finding three. There was one cluster, cluster uh, campaign 15, that was not present in any of the 30 clusters that we found here. And then we started to looking in what is happening here. Why does it actually not end up in the, the larger clusters? Well, then we looked into the, the smaller clusters. So we uh, remember we had about 400 clusters. So we're looking into the other clusters, which of them all belonging to campaign C15. So the green dots are the campaign, and the red dots here are all clusters contributing to that campaign. And we see that they have a lot of small clusters with very similar registration details, even running on the same days, but they have a lot of those different clusters. So it looks like this campaign is much more advanced, actually trying to circumvent automatic detection by clustering tools. And indeed, if you're looking to C15, what was actually the pattern? So let me give you a little bit of insights. Remember, in the beginning, we saw a quite easy campaign criteria where we say, well, they're using one DOM email provider, they have a few streets and phone numbers. Well, this one was much clever. And I would even say 
We give him the award of the best obfuscating campaign in our, our data set. It actually is about 500 domains that were registered over a long period of time, 258 days. And they were actually using a generation tool to create fake identities. So they actually used the lover tool tool, they loaded it with Dutch information, and then also complemented in the last months with English uh, surname, last names, and streets. And they actually created 98 registrants with that. Then the next step, what were the domain names looking like? Well, interesting, because of this audience, they were actually Dutch words. So that was also the reason why we, by analyzing the domain names, it popped up that there was similarities, similarities between different clusters. So they're actually using a large vocabulary of Dutch words, and they're always combining two or three words, and there might even be letters in between, one binding letter in between, which does not make any sense in Dutch, but was by, done by the person typing in those words. And we see, luckily, that the same Dutch words in that data set are being reused among different sets of registrants. So within the 98, if they would each individually use a small set of domain names and, and create them, it would be very hard for us to link them. But now, because they were using the same word across 98 registrants, we could easily see that there were relationships between those 98 registrants. We saw also certain patterns in the way they were describing streets and so on, so they made some mistakes in doing the registration which helped us to see, but it gives you the idea. It's, it's very hard to automatically find out that all those registrations are linked together. Also interesting detail, they actually have kind of not fully automated, but they were always registering their registrants in batches of 8, 16, 24, or 32, which was for us an extra validation that we found all of them. But again, we can do this manually. It's very hard to do this automatically. So actually, I would advocate after doing both manual and automated, we probably need b both of both worlds. We actually need the best of both worlds to actually combine both the insight that we easily can see by a human reading to data, also combined with a tool that is actually doing it in a very uh, resistant way. Yeah, and also, well, they because they were using a generation tool, they were also reusing certain registration details across different registrants. No. So um, the question was, is it correct to say that only the last three bullets were actually helping to detect it in the manual analysis? I think it's true for a large part of, of the analysis. Um, there were certain things that were being reused by the uh, Laravel tool as well so that we could link. And they also made some mistakes in the way they were entering street names, which also was something unique compared to all the other campaigns within our data set. But indeed, it was mainly because of the Dutch words that we had a good trigger we, we, we need to investigate. Also interesting, this was the campaign that was not seen very well with Blacklist. I think only 50% of them were on Blacklist services. So with that, I actually going to the end of my talk. So I, I promised you to tell a little bit more how can we automate this and actually making a TLD more secure. Well, how can we go with detection and prevention? And there the insight is, if you now know all those characteristics of how domainers are actually creating new domain names for malicious use, what is the next step that we need to do to actually at registration time already detect or prevent malicious domain names? How far can we go there? So what we did is actually, we again used machine learning tools we used agglomerative clustering based on the similarity, similar as we did in the previous exercise. We also using classification based on the reputation of a phone number, email address, register, and so on. And we're actually combining this in a kind of prediction service. And we now have already early results over the large uh, data set from the past that we around between 60 and 70% of the malicious domain names can already be found at the time of registration with a very, very low false positive rate, like two registrations, three registrations a day which actually means we can easily route already more than half of all the malicious domain names just by making it much harder for the domainers to, make their, to get their registrations into the system. And as we speak, we're actually deploying this as part of IRIS Trust and Security Program to actually prevent those domain names from being registered in the near future within the .eu TLD. So let me conclude. We actually analyzed 40 months of registration data we saw the hit and run strategies what already mentioned in uh, literature. We saw some very long running campaigns and some of the campaigns already started at the beginning or were even continued after our data set was ending. So it actually means that this is actually 
an underestimation of how long campaigns are running. We see a variety in intensity duration, but more important, we see a variety in how adaptive they are to actually lure around the blacklist services. We saw some interesting alignments with business activity on purpose or mimicking, we don't know. Um, we saw also that the top three facilitators have a huge footprint. They actually, the top three facilitators, registrars, email addresses, or the email providers actually represent a large fraction of our data set. And we also saw that with the campaign analysis, we actually can extend the know-how we already have in blacklist services. We saw that we can actually work towards automated campaign identification, and it would actually be a nice interplay between manual and automated. And we also see that we can go to proactive detection and prevention, and I hope within six months I can give you an update on how successful this is actually in practice on the .eu TLD. If you want to know more, we also have a paper published with much more details on all the different parts of the campaign analysis. You can easily download it on the URL provided there. And with that, I'm open for questions or for lunch. You decide. Thank, Thank you, you. Ruben. Thank you. Questions? Because you, are, you will have to start from scratch then. Yeah, well, I, I will be honest, we didn't say all the details. <laughs> we had a uh, nice interesting conversation with the, all the team members and also with the .eu TLD. We give you the flavor, but there are much more details that are actually helping us in detecting. And that's the reason why we don't pr present the full data set, that we don't present the section criteria, but give you rather a flavor. We used email address, we used the street name, and so on. But you're fully right. The, mo the more we disclose, the easier it is for attackers to actually apply it even on other domains. Um, of course, we like the idea that the Dutch are the best, but what is your confidence that, um, uh, that you haven't missed campaigns in your analysis? Yeah. So we did for sure miss campaigns. Um, from all the domains that were blacklisted by Spam House and others, 80% of them ended up in one of the 20 campaigns. So I would say the 20 campaigns already have like an 80% coverage of the existing black services. If I look to how many domains are probably, probably generated by DJ and so on, I would say the 2.5 is probably an underestimate. So we're missing things, but we started from the point, what do we see from the blacklist services? Also for the DJs, it's much more difficult because a lot of domain name registrations with DJ footprints are not registered by the malicious actors, but actually by the security researchers, which makes it much more difficult. Yeah, I have a question. So uh, you researched it for the EU top level domain, right? Yeah. Um, do you have, I have two questions. Do you have an idea why this EU domain was used in the first place? And if you put these security measures in place, uh, are they not moving to another top level domain? Uh, very quickly, so that, that the effect of these security measures uh, are uh, yeah. very easily mitigated. So why did we start with .eu? Well, in order to actually have the idea of actually working on improving security, this is on, on, on demand of the people that actually are running the .eu DLD. That's the reason why we started there. There's a kind of close collaboration already for many years that we're actually trying to improve the security there. So that's the reason there. You collect, you're fully right that actually by raising the bar on one zone, it will actually make it more pushing to other zones. But the main idea is that we want to be very open. So the TLDs are often communicating to each other in, in many conferences. So we're presenting this work as well. And the idea is if we raise the bar together, it will be a little bit harder for the attacker. We will never be able to completely erode it. But if the attacker has to spend more money and is less effective in doing that, that's the main idea. And in that sense, it might be the first step, but we are not the only one working on this. We see that all the large TLDs like .com and so on are also trying to improve the number of malicious registrations being dropped. One quick last question. Um, yeah, okay. So, sorry. Uh, so, um, phishing best practices recommend that you use um, already classified domains uh, because a lot of organizations use uh, devices such as IBM Blue Coat, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. And the idea is um, you try to leverage the trust or classification uh, those tools already use into pretty much start from a trusted position, right? Yeah. And the question is, why did you decide not to consider uh, re-registration or uh, yeah, registration of, or actually purchasing of already registered yeah. domain? So th there are two reasons why we actually close the scope to newly registered domain names. I would say the first one is, is 
the context. We need ground truth to know actually whether the domain name is malicious or benign. And uh, when we are actually doing ray registration or transfers, that actually means that domain names have already a reputation. And in that sense, it could already, because they have a, a benign reputation at that moment, that we don't have a clear view on how does these sort of things are evolving. So this is one thing. Um, the other thing is, with the new legal registrations, we, we, we can still do something. We can actually prevent them from being active. If you say we have a domain name that is already active for about five years, eight years, what are the means that you have in, uh, that you have in place to say, now we will start preventing it from a legacy point of view? You have no means of actually something that might have legitimate traffic that gets reported and then start to block. Whereas the impact of something that is newly registered, then you can start communicating, your legal team can contact them and asking what is the purpose of this domain name, do you have all the documents and so on. And that's the reason why we focused on, on, on the, the newly. But I think even the ones that are registered already in the past might actually provide additional context to see even for the newly ones, those might be name servers with a lot of toxicity, for instance. And in that sense, it could improve it. But I think it's much harder to, to do the detect and prevention because once the domain name is, in, is active, it's much harder to, to do any regulation on it. Okay. Thank you, Liv. <coughs>